This is James Myers with a quick note about this episode, which has taken a bit longer to prepare than normal. A poor internet connection in the first half of the recording cut off some words spoken, and so you'll hear a few short gaps of 10 seconds or less, which interrupted a few speakers. The meaning has, however, been preserved, and I hope you'll enjoy listening to this episode as much as I have for its great insights into Plato's Symposium. Welcome to Plato's Pod, where we engage in a group discussion on selections from the complete works of Plato, the philosopher and geometer who wrote nearly 2,400 years ago. Today is May 14, 2023, and I'm your host, James Myers. It's a pleasure to welcome in discussion members of the Toronto, Calgary, and Chicago philosophy meetup groups. Whether you've been with us before or are here for the first time, whether you have experience with or are new to Plato's works, I encourage you to add your voice to our dialogue. To contribute your thoughts, please use the raise hands feature in Zoom. To keep the discussion flowing and ensure everyone has a chance to speak, I'll call you in the order that hands are raised, using first name only. I've suggested three themes and excerpts from today's reading of the second part of three parts of Plato's Symposium, covering from 189a to 212c, and these are posted on the shared drive linked to the event notice on meetup.com. We can focus on these or any of the other themes, and for everyone's benefit, please relate your comments and opinions to Plato's text. As we exchange thoughts in today's reading, I'll briefly summarize and try to connect different perspectives to a common thread. After we finish recording in two hours, I welcome anyone who wishes to remain online for Plato's Cafe, a casual half-hour discussion on Plato or philosophy in general. So two weeks ago, we heard parts of three speeches on the subject of love, told at a symposium, or drinking party, attended by a group of hungover Athenians. Today, we'll hear three more perspectives on love, first from Aristophanes, with Agathon falling, And finally, from Socrates, who relates the perspective he heard earlier from the somewhat mysterious wise woman Diotima. Socrates provides scarce details of who Diotima is, other than that she is from Mantinea and that she is, to his thinking, a sophist. If Diotima is a sophist, she is clearly different from two other sophists, Hippias and Protagoras, whom we have recently discussed. Diotima does not demand money in exchange for her wisdom, and her wisdom is on love itself. Perhaps this is why Socrates does not claim knowledge of love itself, but like his teacher Diotima, he has learned the art of love. A philosopher, from the roots of the word, is a lover of wisdom, and so could it be that Socrates has not attached the prefix philo to the sophist Diotima because it would be redundant. Can someone be a lover of love? Several participants two weeks ago noted that love is not just of one human for another, but love is also a human's devotion to wisdom. In our discussions on the philobus, we learned that wisdom, at least as Socrates defined it, is knowledge of motion through time. And we may see today some evidence of love of wisdom from each of the speakers. Another key observation was brought out in our first discussion, that each of the speakers seems to convey some grains of truth in their words, although each in a way that clearly differs from the other and wrapped in contexts that make the truth of the speeches as a whole highly debatable. So I thought today I would offer the three themes for discussion in a different way, not sequentially, as I would normally, but to take parts of the speeches of Aristophanes and Agathon and contrast each of them to the words of Diotima. I think we'll see Diotima weave together the grains of truth from the other speakers and playing a role that perhaps strengthens the dialectic of the whole exercise of the symposium in finding the first principles of love in itself. Diotima proclaims that love is a quest by us mortals for immortality, which is possible only for the soul but not the body. In Diotima's telling, love is our only path to the timelessness of the universal state of being when we are constrained in our time-bound state of becoming. So in reaching her conclusion, Diotima's words relate to Aristophanes, who spoke of love binding two halves into the single whole from which they originated. Her words also resonate with Agathon's, who refers, as he admits partly in fun and partly in moderate seriousness, to love as a softness, as if it is a fluid that flows without the constraints of need and desire. In reflecting the words of all previous speakers as he relays his learning from Diotima, Socrates emphasizes his goal, which is the quest for truth among goodness and beauty. So we're left to wonder whether love is teachable, and this is maybe why Socrates does not say that he has learned about love itself from Diotima, only that he learned the art of love. After all, in his artfully poetic presentation, Agathon acknowledges at 197a that, quote, you can't give to another what you don't have, and you can't teach what you don't know. Unquote. This may seem logical for a thing like love, which, unlike knowledge, seems not to be a teachable subject, when, as Socrates stated in the Mino, all knowledge is recollection. Is love a recollection and object of knowledge? 
or is it the practice of recollection? So let me start with a reading from Aristophanes with a rather curious tale of humans originating as spheres who were cut in half by Zeus and forever thereafter seeking their matching half to form a whole. Then Diotima will have something to say on that. So let me just share my screen here. And this is Aristophanes speaking at 191a to 192d. I'll just read this. Now, since their natural form, and here he's referring to a sphere, had been cut in two, each one longed for its own other half, and so they would throw their arms about each other, weaving themselves together, wanting to grow together. In that condition, they would die from hunger and general idleness, because they would not do anything apart from each other. Whenever one of the halves died and one was left, the one that was left still sought another and wove itself together with that. Sometimes the half he met came from a woman, as we call her now, sometimes it came from a man. Either way, they kept on dying. Then, however, Zeus took pity on them and came up with another plan. He moved their genitals around to the front. Before then, you see, they used to have their genitals outside, like their faces, and they cast seed and made children, not in one another, but in the ground, like cicadas. So Zeus brought about this relocation of genitals, and, and in doing so, he invented interior reproduction. And I just underline the word reproduction there, because we'll see that in Dionema. Reproduction by the man in the woman. The purpose of this was so that when a man embraced a woman, he would cast a seed and they would have children. But when male embraced male, they would at least have the satisfaction of intercourse, after which they could stop embracing, return to their jobs, and look after their other needs in life. This, then, is the source of our desire to love each other. Love is born into every human being. It calls back the halves of our original nature together. It tries to make one out of two and heal the wound of human nature. Each of us, then, is a matching half of a human whole, because each was sliced like a flatfish, two out of one, and each of us is always seeking the half that matches him. That's why a man who is split from the double sort, which used to be called androgynous, runs after women. Many lecherous men have come from this class, and so do the lecherous women who run after men. Women who are split from a man, however, pay no attention at all to men. They are oriented more towards women. And lesbians came from this class, and just I'll stop there and note that that's a modern translation, I assume, of what they're referring to, the, the word lesbians. To continue, people who are split from a male are male-oriented. When they are boys, because they are chips off the male block, they love men and enjoy lying with men and being embraced by men. Those are the best of boys and lads because they are the most manly in their nature. Of course, some say such boys are shameless, but they're lying. It's not that they have no shame that such boys do this, you see, but because they are bold and brave and masculine, and they tend to cherish what is like themselves. Do you want me to prove it? Look, these are the only kind of boys who grow up to be real men in politics. When they're grown men, they are lovers of young men, and they naturally pay no attention to marriage or to making babies, except insofar as they are required to by local custom. They, however, are quite satisfied to live their lives with one another unmarried. In every way, then, this sort of man grows up as a lover of young men and a lover of love, always rejoicing in his own kind. And just uh, skipped a few lines here and uh, to reach the conclusion to this part, uh, Aristophanes goes on, It's obvious that the soul of every lover longs for something else. His soul cannot say what it is, but like an oracle, it has a sense of what it wants, and like an oracle, it hides behind a riddle. Suppose two lovers are lying together and Hephaestus stands over them with his mending tools, asking, what is it you human beings really want from each other? And suppose they're perplexed and he asks them again, is this your heart's desire then, for the two of you to become parts of the same whole, as near as can be, and never to separate, day or night? Because if that's your desire, I'd like to weld you together and join you into something that is naturally whole, so that the two of you are made into one. So that was a bit I wanted to read from Aristophanes. Again, that rather interesting, odd story about people starting as spheres, Zeus cutting them in half, and forever thereafter, they're seeking their other half. And I don't know, you know, we had this, this theme that we were talking about last time, uh, two weeks ago, about grains of truth in these speeches. And I don't know if we see grains of truth in the speech of Aristophanes, Certainly, it, it contains some art, some poetry, and a very interesting idea. So I can go on and, and read the comparison to what uh, Diotima says. And this is 
this is to to jump forward to 206b to 207a but first darren your thoughts i, I wasn't sure if you were actually posing a question for us so <laughs> yeah yeah for sure so I, I i think you were so i guess i'll jump in yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you wanted to get ahead to the um, diatoma stuff, and then you know, yeah. and then open up. You know, let, let, but... let's let's talk about uh, what Aristophanes said, and then we can contrast it to diatoma. Okay, great. Yeah. So I guess I'll just um, make a couple comments about this. This speech is much more, um, how should we say it, like gender progressive than <laughs> than, the, than the one <laughs> presented by uh, Pausanias last week, who was saying like, um, you know, who was pretty much like excluding women from this domain of realm of love because you know it's exclusive for like men because they're more intelligent and um all that stuff so we can't necessarily attribute like sort of certain like patriarchal or gender regressive views to plato per se <laughs> just mm -hmm. because it was in pausanias mm -hmm. uh, we have a much more different view of um gender and sexuality in this particular speech so it's you know the contrasts on on that theme are interesting so you can't straightforwardly accuse like Plato being like patriarchal or you know mm -hmm. even heteronormative or whatever. The second thing I would say is that so an aspect of this speech that I thought was interesting that wasn't really covered in um, your passages was that the reason Zeus wanted to slice them in half, human beings in half, was because they originally had great ambitions for themselves and they kept trying to like ascend to heaven to usurp the gods or attack the gods. Which is why, you know, ultimately the gods had to punish human beings by splitting them in half. And so they end up, instead of trying to um, ascend to heaven and you serve the gods, they have love instead. So regarding like what kind of seeds of truth are in each of these speeches, I just find this like metaphor to be so provocative, right? That <laughs> that love replaces this other kind of amb original ambition we had, you know, for like great things, essentially, and to be like gods and how we were punished for it. And so like, and then, you know, so this leads to Aristophanes, like great lines that some of which you said, like how um, love is the thing that makes uh, one out of two to heal the wound of human nature. <laughs> and so anyway, I, I, I'm just like, yeah, I just want to bring that into the picture too. And just say how like altogether, the picture is very provocative. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe just one last thing quickly is that I, I also really like how the speech says that when people fall in love, um, it's like an oracle and their souls can't say exactly like why they love this person. Love is on like a riddle. Um, like the actual two that they, they know they love this other person. So, um, cause I guess they don't, maybe don't have this memory of this like original, <laughs> um, original incident. So anyway, yeah. So that, that, that's another, that's another aspect of it that I find very, um, provocative yeah the whole speech is just really great so mm -hmm. just on its own regardless of any comparisons mm -hmm. we could make yeah that, that's great and I, I like the way that you pointed out the you know that love replaces the original ambition of usurping the gods in this uh in this story and you know throughout the the dialogue i guess many things are attributed to the gods uh emotions battles among each other you know wanting humans to worship them uh, you know, the gods are needy, uh, I, I think, is is how they're being presented in this dialogue. And the interesting thing is uh, the way the, the speakers talk about love uh, as, as as a god who is not needy, but then Diotoma corrects them and says, well, love is, in fact, a, a needy god. Um, so this is an interesting play maybe on that. And, and as you said, too, also, where you brought in the memory theme, we can't remember the original condition uh, that we started in. And maybe this is this constant reference to memory, not just in this dialogue, but in many of Plato's dialogues. So really good thoughts there. So thank you for that. And Eric. Uh, so I just wanted to comment on the provocative message. I think it speaks to something. Uh, it's very thematic in a lot of things. So you have uh, that scene in the Iliad where it was diam di Diomedes, Ares, I believe, and he's um, hurt Ares to the point where Ares had a retreat. And I think it also speaks on a lot of themes we've seen in movies, like gods versus other entities. And you have 
the myths of fathers usurping their sons. Um, you have Uranus and Kronos, Zeus and uh, Zeus and Kronos. And there was, I believe, one that was playing out with Zeus. I think it was between Apollo, maybe. But, but you also see it in the Bible where in Genesis, I think if I remember reading it correctly, God stopped Adam and Eve from eating from the tree of life. So we've eaten from the tree of knowledge and God is stopping us from eating from the tree of tree of life because he fears that we ourselves would become gods in some way. Uh, so it's interesting to hear this story of being split up. I mean, it kind of sounds like almost it is true. And my question would be is, you know, at what level are we at? You know, we know maybe it's just two, two times, not our body perhaps, but our souls sliced in two. And, you know, how long has that been going on? Maybe four or five times and, and so on. So, yeah, very, very interesting to think. And I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Some great thoughts there. And, and, I think you referenced kind of these universal themes uh, when you be began to speak and these themes have persisted through time. You know, you mentioned Zeus and usurping Kronos and these are themes that continue through time 2,400 years ago to today. There's still themes, you know, as you said, we still see them in movies. Um, the interesting thought about souls being divided in two makes me think, and there are some references here to the Republic and the divided line of knowledge. And it makes me think that maybe that could be some of what Diotima is trying to say when she refers to the spirit and to reason. Uh, those are divisions of the soul, the soul in the Republic being divided into three reason, spirit, and appetite. And so let's, let's see what we can make of that because maybe that's a, a theme that we can bring into it. Uh, the divided soul. I, I like that. Very interesting. Thank you. And we'll go to Ernest. Yes, it's a, a very interesting uh, genesis of uh, creations of a man. Mm -hmm. And what's particularly interesting is that originally there were three uh, type of uh, genders. There was not only man and woman, but something in between, uh, which is original uh, Plato mythology about creation and about uh, round faces that what we now know what the face is, but actually there were two faces, like in Janus, one in front, one on the back. They were divided like an apple in the half, which is a very interesting uh, mythology of creation, uh, very original. Nothing uh, like that has been uh, before. And also about arrogance, that people were going crazy, nothing to do but uh, fight the gods. Instead, they need to be offered something else to do better than fighting the gods. So that's very interesting uh, uh, philosophy and myth of creation with four legs and four arms. Yeah. Yes. That, that's interesting the way you point. And, and thank you for pointing out that there was that middle gender. I, I think in part that I read that word androgynous was used there. But uh, yeah, originally Aristophanes makes this point that originally there was the male, the female, and there was the in-between. And we see number and references to the middle a lot through this dialogue. And so I think there's some clues that Plato is planting there. Certainly the idea of two parts becoming whole. Um, if you think of mathematics, uh, two parts being fractions, adding to a whole, you know, one half plus one half equals one, which is what I titled this section of of my notes and and Dionoma will talk about that too Dionoma will talk a lot about the middle and so maybe this is this is setting this up as maybe one of those grains of truth that there is this kind of middle middle state which isn't really of any gender and maybe that's you know to go back to what Darren was talking about this idea of gender fluidity maybe in this dialogue is is something that's present so so thanks for that it brings out some important points and Darren, your thoughts? Just to continue on what uh, Ernest was saying. Um, so I, I agree, like this myth of our origins is just really interesting and unique. And uh, one aspect that I really liked <laughs> is that how, so these uh, original beings were spheres 
and how if they wanted to travel really fast, they they travel by cartwheels. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that image. That it's a great image. They, yeah. yeah, that you yeah. just have people just running around <laughs> doing cartwheels <laughs> um, to get from place to place. So I just really love that picture. It's just yeah. really imaginative. And yeah. um, I mean, it's not surprising. It's in the voice of Aristophanes, you know, who's yeah. like supposed to be, you know, one of the greatest playwrights. So it's so another just a quick thought about this section thing that I liked and maybe is um kind of significant aspect of it is that at the end of it, um Aristophanes warns us that if we don't like um I guess like perfect love or um or I guess live in this way, then the gods might feel threatened and will split us in two again. <laughs> and yeah. um has this great description of you know what we all what we'll end up looking like. We'll end up just being like flayed in these little pieces. <laughs> so and then you know it'll just be it'll just be chaos, right? Then we'll have to find three other parts or whatever. So I really like this idea that we should like so this is our way of life and we should keep to it. Like this is like our nature now. And you know he also says this one thing that this one line that I really liked. I posted in the comments he says there's just one way for the human race to flourish. We must bring love to its perfect conclusion. And so this is what we have to do. <laughs> Otherwise, we're just going to end up being split into more and more little pieces if we try to aim for something higher, like try to usurp the gods from their place in heaven. And so, yeah, so this this thought that yeah, it's almost like a dark warning, but it's also kind of like lovely, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, a bit of it that I thought was sort of nice. Yeah, and maybe prophetic too, in the sense that if we don't practice love, we will divide against ourselves, maybe, and uh, and the damage that would ensue from that would be significant, as as I think we, as I think we discover sometimes with wars and uh, hatred, which is the opposite of love, I guess. So that's great. Well, let's maybe just take a look at what Diodema says here. So this is skipping several sections uh, later. This is 206B to 207A. And I just thought, you know, again, it would be interesting to juxtapose Diotima's words on this idea of division by two and, and these two halves seeking a whole. And, and maybe she's putting it in a context that has some universal truth in it, but, but taking parts of what Aristophanes says as uh, grains of truth. So, At 206b, Diodema starts, In a word, then, love is wanting to possess the good forever. That's very true, I said. This, then, is the object of love, she said. Now, how do lovers pursue it? We'd rightly say that when they are in love, they do something with eagerness and zeal. But what is it precisely that they do? Can you say? If I could, I said, I wouldn't be your student, filled with admiration for your wisdom and trying to learn these very things. Well, I'll tell you, she said. It is giving birth in beauty, whether in body or in soul. It would take divination to figure out what you mean. I can't. Well, I'll tell you more clearly, she said. All of us are pregnant, Socrates, both in body and in soul. And as soon as we come to a certain age, we naturally desire to give birth. Now, no one can possibly give birth in anything ugly, only in something beautiful. That's because when a man and woman come together in order to give birth... This is a godly affair. Pregnancy, reproduction, this is an immortal thing for a mortal animal to do, and it cannot occur in anything that is out of harmony, but ugliness is out of harmony with all that is godly. Beauty, however, is in harmony with the divine. Therefore, the goddess who presides at childbirth, she's called Moira, or Ilithuia, is really beauty. That's why, whenever pregnant animals or persons draw near to beauty, they become gentle and joyfully disposed and give birth and reproduce. But near ugliness, they are foul-faced and draw back in pain. They turn away and shrink back and do not reproduce. And because they hold on to what they carry inside them, the labor is painful. This is the source of the great excitement about beauty, that anyone who is pregnant and already teeming with life, beauty releases them from their great pain. You see, Socrates, she said, what love wants is not beauty, as you think it is. Oh, what is it then? Reproduction and birth in beauty. Maybe, I said. Certainly, she said. Now, why reproduction? It's because reproduction goes on forever. It is what mortals have in place of immortality. A love must desire immortality along with the good. If what we agreed earlier was right, that love wants to possess the good forever, it follows from our argument that love must desire immortality. So, 
that was the the contrast I thought Di Diorama was making to that idea of division in two and seeking the whole. I think what she's maybe saying here in this part is, as Socrates is relating it, is that the whole which love seeks is immortality, a wholeness with time, a wholeness with the universe. Our bodies are limited. We know there's no way that we can make our bodies immortal, but the soul can be immortal. I mean, this is, this is I think, the view of Plato, and I think there are those who contest that view. But this would be the view of Plato, I think, that the soul is immortal. And so it's the soul that experiences love. And in doing so, as Diadema is saying, the soul is looking for immortality, no end, no beginning and no end. And I think there are some, again, mathematical clues in this dialogue about that which has no beginning and no end, uh, geometric clues too. I think there's some reference, several references to circles being round. I think there's some some interesting connections that Plato is trying to make there in the background, but certainly this part that Diodema presents, you know, how do we tie it together with what Aristophanes says and, and how do we pick out the, the truth here? What do we see in, in Diodema's words? Is there anything that particularly seems profound? Is she taking a new perspective on humans or, you know, th this perspective on time, I thought was interesting, you know, the, the way that time is brought into it, into this and knowing that there's a bodily end, but that there is uh, potentially no end for the, uh, for the soul. So Adam, your thoughts. I mean, I don't have anything profound to say, but I immediately noticed uh, the juxtaposition and, and uh, Dao Tima uh, is, um, uh, perspective. Uh, Aristophanes took a third person perspective about, you know, broadly what this is what happened. This is the story he narrated what was going on where, whereas Diotima is extremely intimate. Um, she's expressing a first person perspective about the production uh, of love, immortality, time, birth. And it it strongly reminded me of this podcast I was listening to, I don't know, two or three months ago from a, um, how do I say this? Somebody who was arguing for traditional marriage and traditional family and family producing, and it was a woman. Um, and the way she was describing childbirth and how much she felt like this being that came out of her was a part of her and she she wanted to give it everything and and see it flourish and like it was her uh but her that she knew and had a sense that was going to going to go beyond her and would be more beautiful than her and just the way she was describing and and being a cheerleader for child production i hate to say it that cold way but whatever uh child rearing uh child giving life to something somehow as a met magical ability that women have i'm i'm seeing her words and diotima's argument although diotima's argument is even more profound because she brings in uh you know immortality and and beauty and expands it beyond just the mere physical production of of birth but the perspective it, it's i can see the magic the same magic I, I like that perspective, you know, that change in perspective that you brought around, you know, Diodem is not relaying a third party story as Aristophanes is. And the, the story you related of listening to that podcast, I think was very interesting because it, I think it highlights what Diodem is talking about with respect to reproduction, you know, that reproduction is making two of one or actually making, making uh, uh, one of three, maybe or one of two, I guess, from each parent. So maybe again, this one and two numbering is is interesting here and, and the connection to reproduction, that sense of immortality, I think that you were talking about, uh, about of the mother giving birth, you know, that, that sense that she is creating another life of herself, maybe a very powerful example of what Diodema is talking about here. Uh, it is, reproduction is the only thing that humans have that will get us close to immortality. That and and love, I think, is what Diodem is saying. So thank you for those uh, those perspectives. Really helpful. Uh, Darren. Oh wait, hang on. There we go. Okay, sorry. 
forgot about the button. Um, <laughs> so first of all, um, thank you for reading this in Diotima's voice. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if it was Diotima's <laughs> voice, but it, it's the only voice I could muster. Right. Yeah. Well, re regardless, that's exactly how I'm going to hear Diotima in my head from now on. So thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, regarding this section, maybe I'm going to take a bit of a different, like more skeptical perspective. This is just my attempt at figuring out what's going on at the moment. So I noticed that Socrates like is a bit hesitant in this section, which is unlike other sections where Diodema, uh speaks. So, you know, he says that maybe, which I thought was interesting because I feel like in other dialogues where he says maybe it's often <laughs> where Socrates is just listening. He's like, maybe it, it was always in the context of things that were kind of maybe suspicious um, maybe a bit correct, but maybe a bit suspicious. And so I felt like this might be what's going on here. And then on the next page, of course, um, where he, you know, Diodama is going to continue about talking about reproduction and physical sex and all that stuff. And then Socrates will say that Diodama speaks in the manner of a perfect sophist, which, you know, sort of at least has to raise a bit of an eyebrow for a reader. You know, we may, I don't know, like we we'll have to look at the original translation, but like whenever that comes up, it's like, uh, maybe there's something a bit weird going on here. And so for me, the speech may be a, something that's a bit dissatisfying about it, which maybe Socrates also find dissatisfying. Although, you know, Socrates obviously, you know, is going to take a lot and learn a lot from Diotima. But on this particular section, so I, I guess even just before this baby, you know, Diodema says, what love wants is not beauty as you think it is, but reproduction and birth and beauty. So I don't know, like, and there's something weird about, I know there's something weird about this idea in its in and of itself, but like also how Diatima flushes it out just above, like how <laughs> someone has to give, like wants to reproduce in something beautiful, I guess. I think that's how that was described possibly give birth in something beautiful like it's but in this section i mean okay there's other ways it's gonna get fleshed out later but here it's like it sounds quite literal somewhat you like you want to mate with someone like beautiful like literally and <laughs> i don't know there's just something odd about this section so anyway i'm just like pointing out that maybe there's there, there's i'm just providing maybe a perspective we might have on this that that maybe there's some distance that's between both Socrates and Diotima, but also maybe like Plato is trying to put between us and what's going on in the text, just, you know, by, by having Socrates say maybe in, in this section that Diotima is sounding, you know, like a perfect sophist, which means she sounds very, con like a, a sophist is very convincing. But of course, as we know from all the other dialogues, it's not necessarily has a, is true or has a relation to the truth. Anyway, I'll just throw in maybe some of my, maybe all my own misgivings too about mm -hmm. this part. That's an interesting perspective, actually. And, um, you know, one thing that Diodema does not do is define what the beautiful is and what the good is. And, you know, maybe in that sense, is is she honoring, is she honoring our lack of knowledge on those things? Uh, or does she expect that we understand what the beautiful is into which reproduction is born? Does she understand or does she respect our lack of understanding of what the good is, or is there an assumption what the good is? You know, maybe as sophists might do, make assumptions or kind of tell us what we should think. As I said in the introduction, she's not charging for her wisdom here, and her wisdom is on a subject that really might not be the object of knowledge, which is love. Knowledge, as Socrates said in the Mino, is recollection. And so is love a matter of recollection? So an interesting point, though, you know, is when Socrates calls Diodema a sophist, what exactly is he getting at there? Uh, it doesn't seem to be in a negative context, like he would speak of Hippias or Protagoras. Uh, he seems to have some respect here for Diodema as a wise woman. And interesting, too, that she's a woman, the only woman speaker um, among all of the speakers in this. And there's maybe a connection there we can think of. So, So thanks for that. And we'll go to Ernest and then Adam. Ernest. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much for highlighting very important points that Diotima was making. Love must desire immortality. And not only that, you can achieve immortality in two different ways. Yeah, that uh, even uh, males are impregnated 
with uh, and can achieve immortality through poetry. And uh, sh she mentions uh, that when you make a creations, even in other fields, when you create something new, it stays forever, and you create it's, uh, something that you are remembered uh, for. Like everyone uh, remembers uh, uh, different uh, creations, like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Mona Lisa. He achieved immortality not uh, through his children, uh, but through his work. Same uh, like he mentions Homer and his his year also. We know and uh, Achilles and uh, all other people that made uh, certain deeds that we always remember, even nameless people. Now, in uh, in new era, we remember that nameless marathon runner who came uh, was running from marathon to uh, Athens and came to the Acropolis and said one word. Nike, victory, and died. And we still run marathon every four years at, during Olympic Games. So he achieved immortality. So <laughs> point is, everyone is in, impregnated and has capacity not only to recreate children, but create something beautiful, mm -hmm. like poetry. Thank you. Wow, that's, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I think it really... That's the the beauty of the memory, I guess, of the person, I think, is and you had such great examples there with both Da Vinci and the marathon runner. I think those were really powerful examples of how we remember people through time and how people, even though their bodies are gone, can become immortal in the memory. And maybe there's an issue here too when they talk about the gods, is that the gods aren't actually subjects of memory. They're subjects of maybe fabrications. I mean, who really knows? Does Homer really know the gods? Does Hesiod really know the gods? Are they remembering something? Or is that just pure art, not based on on a real story? Um, so there's there's a number of different themes in there, but I really like the idea of being remembered for your work and becoming immortal for your work uh, and, and for your art. Um, so that that's a great uh, great connection. Thank you. We'll go to Adam and then Eric. Um, yeah, I was just making another connection to this love must desire immortality thing to a uh, uh, an older TV show called The Pacific, which is about uh, World War II, American World War II soldiers fighting the Japanese in the Pacific Islands. And these two guys are sitting on a long beach, palm trees, beach, as far as you can see on, on both ends. And one of them asks, I think something like, what is war or what is, what is war about or something along those lines. And the guy says, um, he says, well, look down that beach side of the beach and it just goes till you can't see anymore. He says, that's making love. And he says, now look down the beach that way. And it just goes, you know, you, you can't even, it goes so far. You can, you can't even see it. And he says, that's war. And so the same connection is being made that, you know, the opposite of love and creating something and giving something and producing something is not hate. It's death. So it, it ties into that wisdom ties into what Dio, Dio Tima was saying. Mm. That's really a powerful example of limits, two limits, maybe of uh, one limit being death, the other being love and just, the horizon of each of those being completely out of sight. Yeah, that, that was a really good analogy. I really like that. Uh, and I think that helps to keep in mind what Diotima is trying to say in terms of love must desire immortality. And she'll go on to talk about maybe the place of this desire uh, is not from any one of those extremes. I think she's going to say that the place of the desire is actually in the middle. The desire is formed from the place that partakes of neither extreme. That's where love is, right in the middle. Um, so that was a really good example of kind of standing in the middle of that beach and looking, looking to two limits, and one of them is is immortal. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll go to Eric. Yes, I also made a couple of connections after hearing everybody's talk. So one thing that I always keep going back to is. Uh, yes, we give birth and beauty in art and other matters that aren't physical, 
uh, but Diotima still goes, that is both in body and spirit or soul. And I think one part that I connected it with was not just the physical aspects in creating beauty, but after the fact, kind of, you know, raising children sort of thing and creating beautiful souls that then go about creating uh, the beautiful and the good. Uh, and, and I'm always reminded that, and this is probably a little jumping ahead in the symposium, but um, uh, Socrates is never painted as a very beautiful person. Uh, but I think we could agree Socrates has a beautiful soul, I would say. Mm -hmm. I, have a good, uh, I would have a good guess. And then later in the symposium, we have uh, Alcibiades kind of fawning over Socrates. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting idea. I like the way you brought the ending into that, where Alcibiades is just smitten by Socrates, and it's not for Socrates' soul that he's smitten. So maybe that's an interesting way that it kind of brings it all back to this difference between the beauty of the soul and then the rather more mundane beauty of what some people like Alcibiades, maybe more lecherous people, as Aristophanes said at the beginning, maybe that's more what they're limited to in respect of love. So that's neat. And, and the creation of beautiful souls, that was a great line. So thank you for that. Can I, real yeah. quick, James, uh, yeah. what, ver what verb did Eric use? Alcibiades is something in over Socrates. I didn't hear what, what, what he uh, said. I said, I said fawning. Fawn, fawning. Thank yeah, you. Fawning. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks. And, and Darren. So just, uh, first of all, quick comment regarding what James said about Plato putting these words in, uh, in the, um, I, I think that's interesting too. And, um, again, I think it's another interesting contrast with, um, one of the first speeches by Bosanius where <laughs> it's very denigrating of women. So, and, you know, he sort of is denigrating, you know, their intelligence basically. And here, the wisest character of all in this dialogue just turns out to be a woman. So it's almost like a, uh, yeah, there, there's, there's um, interesting ways in which what Diotima says is, is presents a critique of what has various aspects of the previous speeches, but, you know, just the fact it's in the mouth of a woman <laughs> is also maybe a kind of critique too. So regarding the, the content of this section, I mean, maybe we should bring more onto the table too, but I, I do agree with the things that people have said that she does present an interesting perspective in this particular section. She's going to say more later. I still think like, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like a critical voice here. Like, I, I still think it's a, it might be a bit problematic. It might not be something Plato is recommending per se, but it's not that it's not, I mean, it's still an interesting perspective, but maybe we're not supposed to take it completely wholesale. So I'm thinking about like, so this issue about immortality, she says here, a lover must desire immortality along with the good. If what we agreed earlier was right, that love wants to possess the good forever. And she concludes that love must desire immortality. Just on like a purely, I guess, <laughs> logical perspective. <laughs> like, I don't know if the conclusion should be that love must desire immortality per se, because love wants, as we find out more later, like love really wants the good. I mean, <laughs> this is all, this is what all Plato's dialogues are about. <laughs> this mysterious thing got, of the good. So it's not like immortality per se, apart from, you know, our relationship or apprehension of the good. If there's anything going wrong, again, this is just my view. I could be wrong about this. But if there's like, if we're supposed to have misgivings about it, I think it could be that some aspects of Diotima's speech here ends up taking this immortality thing maybe a little too seriously. Like, so the good is related to immortality, but if we separate it, if it's too focused on immortality per se, then I don't know. I feel like we run into problems and I don't know if that's actually what love is going after. So th this could be like in other dialogues, right? Like where the idea of the good gets mixed up with for we read the good pleasure is a good thing. But if we too closely collapse the good as pleasure, then and pleasure is yeah, pleasure is the good thing. Then you, know, you run into problems. So I feel like maybe there's a bit of misgivings here. There's stuff that Diotima says about immortality is good and correct if it's closely, if it remains attached to this concept of the good. But once it sort of becomes this thing that people desire on its own, I think it's problematic. So I, I just want to give one example of this. Just wrap up here with this 
uh, so this is on the next page essentially and this is still at the section where socrates still seems to like be a bit reluctant to agree wholeheartedly which he does about other things Diotima says but here this is in the section where socrates says Diotima is uh, speaking like a perfect sophist and so this is about how heroes seek honor and immortality through honor Diotima says here on 208d do you really think that uh, i can't do the woman's voice <laughs> i'm just kind of <laughs> do my regular voice here uh do you really think that Alcides would have died for Admetus, she asked, or that Achilles would have died after Potarchus, or that your Codrus, Codrus would have died so as to preserve the throne of his sons if they hadn't expected the memory of their virtue, which we still hold in honor, to be immortal? Far from it, she said. I believe that anyone will do anything for the sake of immortal virtue and the glorious fame that follows, and the better the people, the more they will do for they are all in love with immortality. Okay, so this sounds great, right? And, and I think what Ernest says actually is really correct, that some people desire to maybe have their immortality through their work. But of course, the question is like, what's good here and what's actually virtue? And to me, like, again, this is a section where Socrates seems to express the misgivings. It, it seems weird that I don't know if it, that is really the ultimately truly virtuous thing for someone to do a heroic act in on the battlefield because of these are immortality versus doing it simply because it's the good thing to do. So I actually posted a quote in the comments on a meetup about like an example of someone who's doing, you know, something dangerous and risky because like he just felt like it was a good thing to do, not because like he's seeking immortality <laughs> through fame or whatever. So I so again, so I just feel like good is related to immortality in a way, but if it becomes too detached from it, I I, I don't know. I feel like it leads us in weird directions because mm -hmm. I feel like the good thing to do is to act in virtue because it is the good, the right thing to do. Not because like, oh, you know, maybe people remember me one day for it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's a lot of heroic and good acts that people do that are never they're actually never remembered. Yeah. So that if you're seeking that, that like that's another problem with it. That's actually yeah. kind of contingent. You're relying yeah. on something that's not really sure. Yeah. So anyway, and, I just thought, yeah. sorry, I just that went a long time. I just want to throw in this other perspective too. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that um, Diotima is advocating for that kind of uh, heroic goodness, but uh, certainly, you know, you, you point out the question of good, but I would say also there's truth and beauty that they're talking about. Uh, certainly Socrates talks a lot about truth. And Diotima says beauty as well. So it's the true, the good, and the beautiful somehow are brought into this whole equation. And somehow, I guess, through knowledge, because, you know, love is not just love of one human for another, as was observed last time. It's also love of knowledge uh, or love of wisdom. And so I think that, you know, there's that part in it. So maybe reproduction gives us a chance to pursue that love of wisdom over time. Uh, whereas if we weren't able to reproduce, uh, we wouldn't have that shot at it. So, so interesting um, perspectives. And we'll go to Adam, then Ernest, and Eric. Adam, with um, making a similar thing when Ernest was making his his good point about immortality and and other ways other than birth, uh, childbirth, and like immortality is yours take it and then i thought to myself i mean that guy went on to just kill some some innocent people that uh mm, uh kind of kind of not all, all immortality is love so yeah i i see your point Karen. good point thank you uh ernest and then eric adam you're exactly right that's this is um, what i wanted to talk about even uh, in homer iliad the philosophical question was all throughout the book. Is Achilles asking his mother, should I die young and remember the immortally, or should I die in old age and nobody will remember me? At the mm -hmm. time, at, should I achieve immortality? That's mm -hmm. very, very important throughout the uh, history of the time. Yeah, there's there's certainly a lot in in history that demonstrates, I think, that theme. So you know, these kind of universal themes going on, and people searching for immortality through actions, maybe. So thank you for that, and Eric. Um, so the myths that I always go back to when I'm 
when I'm hearing everybody speak. Two that I would like to compare first is uh, Orpheus entering the underworld to rescue his lover, Eurydice. And the other myth is Theseus entering the underworld. Um, and in this case, Theseus is trying to abduct Persephone, the queen of the underworld. And in the Orpheus myth, uh, it is Orpheus through his art convinces Persephone to take back his his lover. So yeah, for Theseus, there was those quite a punishment. He was set in the chair of, I think, about forgetfulness, I believe. But I won't go too much into detail. Uh, but the other one, the other myth that I wanted to connect with the Orpheus myth is I believe there was a prophecy surrounding Achilles that he, whoever lays with his mother, the son would eventually usurp the father. Uh, so Zeus didn't want that and gave, I think it was the nymph Thetis to, I, I forget Achilles' father's name, but Achilles would obviously become the best amongst the Greeks. And, and I know in the symposium, Achilles is, is one of the names that's written. Uh, so I'm, I, I always go back to the idea, you know, what would Achilles, why would he be known as best amongst the Greek? Uh, was it because he was the greatest warrior amongst all the Greeks and Trojans? Or was it because he knowing the prophecy that if he would kill Hector, he would die. And after Patroclus being moved by all the war and the deaths of all the, all the Greeks, um, that he would don Achilles' armor, go into battle, be killed, and Achilles would go avenge him. So then I would connect it again with the Orpheus myth. Um, Orpheus did not die to enter the underworld, and Achilles did. But yeah, I would I would leave it at that. That's interesting. These myths that live on, they develop sort of an immortality of their own stories, I guess. And that's that's interesting. And interesting too how um, you know, as you point out, those are woven into the story here. It's important to know that background, I think, because again, I think a lot of readers now don't know those uh, those details behind these characters, but certainly those characters have become, I think, immortal in the memory, at least for, for those actions. So it's an example maybe of how poetry can become immortal, uh, but maybe fact is another thing. So um, we'll take Darren. And then after Darren, I, I want to go on and read the second part of this. Um, so Darren, your thoughts. Uh, Eric, um, the sort of heroic pursuit of uh, immortality that Diotima describes. So it was a quote I posted on the meetup site as a comment. So it's by uh, Václav Havel, who was the first president of the Czech Republic. And uh, he was a dissident when um, Czechoslovak Czechoslovakia was uh, under, um, I guess, like Soviet rule. He was like an author and he was a dissident. He went to prison many times for his uh, activism. So I think he's he's someone with more authority. And he, I think he is recognized as someone with quite a bit of more authority. And he became, you know, he was elected uh, as president for many years after. And so this is his quote. He says about his activism and dissidence at great risk to, him, to his own self, of course. So he says, uh, we never decided to become dissidents. We have been transformed into them without quite knowing how. Sometimes we have ended up in prison without precisely knowing how. We simply went ahead and did certain things that we felt we ought to do and that seemed to us decent to do, nothing more nor less. So I feel like this is someone who's acting on doing something good, not because it's some like grandstanding heroic thing. It just like it could just be some little thing that they feel like this is just a decent thing to do. It just because it's a good thing. It's like a, almost like a humble attitude towards it. But to me, it seems like a proper relationship <laughs> to have towards the good. Um, it's like the actual virtuous thing rather than desiring immortality per se. You're just doing not you're not doing it because like you, you're hoping for some fame, which is probably very unlikely in the context he lived in. <laughs> but because it's just a good thing to do. And ironically, though, he has become immortal <laughs> because of doing these virtuous acts because they're good, because, you know, the airport, the international airport there is named after him now. And of course, you know, he's just widely known. 
so anyway, I just, yeah, I thought this quote, I actually didn't think of this quote as a contrast to, you know, the section of the text when I was, uh, when I posted it, but like, it just occurred to me that it is like quite a interesting contrast. Mm -hmm. And interesting too, the, what he says, we ought, you know, that, that which we ought to do, I guess, is not something that was personally beneficial to him. You know, he winds up in jail or others wind up in jail for doing these things, but it's just, uh, you know, the, the principled thing to do. And I guess looking for the first principles of a thing like good, which people act like that on and, and become immortal for their actions on behalf of the good, or at least seeking the good. Uh, nobody knows what the good is, but seeking it, I think, is uh, is what maybe brings immortality to some people. So that's a, that's a great example. Yeah. And just I just want to point out like, quickly an aspect of that that I really like is that like it's not self and congratulatory anyway like i'm like so brave or whatever it's just like he's just doing he, he it sounds like he's just doing little little acts that just feel like they're the good thing to do but this is how people end up in trouble in these regimes so it's not like grandstanding or self-absorbed i feel like it's just a person with a very humble relationship actually to what is to the good i feel like he has a proper relationship with you know this thing called the good and that's it you know it's, it doesn't have to be pretentious or self-congratulatory <laughs> It's the attitude that comes through the quote that I feel like I, I really like. Mm -hmm. It kind of recalls part of our discussion in the, the last episode when we were talking about that reference that was made to the Persian Empire and maybe the lack of love in uh, kind of more absolutist regimes like that. And so maybe your Vaclav Havel quote kind of ties into that idea that was raised in our last session. So thank you for that. Um, I want to go on now and read this part of Agathon. So Agathon's the second speaker in today's series. And I've labeled this section, the fluidity of love as the mediator having zero resistance, because Diotima will go on to talk about how love finds itself in the middle. And, and so I thought I would set this up with this part from Agathon's speech from 195C to 196A. Agathon says, those old stories Hesiod and Parmenides told about the gods, those things happened under necessity, not love, if what they say is true. For not one of all those violent deeds would have been done, no castrations, no imprisonments, if love had been present among them. There would have been peace and brotherhood instead, as there has been now as long as love has been the king of the gods. So he is young, and besides being young, he is delicate. It takes a poet as good as Homer to show how delicate the god is. For Homer says that mischief is a god and that she is delicate. Well, that her feet are delicate anyway. He says, hers are delicate feet. Not on the ground does she draw nigh. She walks instead upon the heads of men. A lovely proof, I think, to show how delicate she is. She doesn't walk on anything hard. She walks only on what is soft. We shall use the same proof about love, then, to show that he is delicate. For he walks not on earth, not even on people's skulls, which are not really soft at all, but in the softest of all things that are, there he walks, there he has his home. For he makes his home in the characters, in the souls of gods and men, and not even in every soul that comes along. When he encounters a soul with a harsh character, he turns away. But when he finds a soft and gentle character, he settles down in it. Always then he is touching with his feet and with the whole of himself what is softest in the softest places. He must therefore be most delicate. He is youngest then and most delicate. In addition, he has a fluid, supple shape, for if he were hard, he would not be able to enfold a soul completely or escape notice when he first entered it or withdrew. Besides, his graceful good looks prove that he is balanced and fluid in his nature. Everyone knows that love has extraordinary good looks, and between ugliness and love, there is unceasing war. So this is Agathon's rather, I don't know, poetic presentation. Love is this state of perfection, according to Agathon. Love is born with perfection. Love is soft, uh, gentle, all of these characteristics. Now, you know, in this section, I've put a number of footnotes because I think there are some mathematical references here, particularly with this idea of softness and the idea of some sort of fluid motion, you know, fluid dynamics. I think there's there's something in here, I think, that Plato is trying to say. We don't need to get into that today, but, you know, I just, I think there is something in that expression of love as some sort of lack of resistance. It's that kind of free motion that uh, is is capable in love. You know, if wisdom is knowledge of motion, then maybe love is freedom of motion. Anyway, I wanted to read that 
it's kind of a short bit from Agathon. Agathon winds up admitting that he knows love, nothing about love. It's kind of a humorous conclusion uh, when Agathon reaches the end and and he admits that he knows nothing of love. But then he started by saying, as I mentioned earlier, that he's he's saying this half in fun and, and half in, in seriousness. So he doesn't profess to be fully knowledgeable on love. But, you know, again, maybe there's some grains of truth in this. So um, I can go on and read Diotima's rather longer section that I thought kind of relates to this part that Agathon just spoke. And this is where Diotima puts love in the middle. And so this is from 202a to 203a. Socrates starts, so I said, what do you mean, Diotima? Is love ugly then and bad? But she said, watch your tongue. Do you really think that if a thing is not beautiful, it has to be ugly? I certainly do. And if a thing's not wise, is it ignorant? Or haven't you found out yet that there's something in between wisdom and ignorance? What's that? It's judging things correctly without being able to give a reason. Surely you see that this is not the same as knowing. For how could knowledge be unreasoning? And it's not ignorance either. Or how could what hits the truth be ignorance? Correct judgment, of course, has this character. It is in between understanding and ignorance. True, I said, as you say. Then don't force whatever is not beautiful to be ugly, or whatever is not good to be bad. It's the same with love. When you agree he is neither good nor beautiful, you need not think he is ugly and bad. He could be something in between, she said. Yet everyone agrees he's a great god, I said. Only those who don't know, she said. Is that how you mean everyone, or do you include those who do know? Oh, everyone together. And she laughed. Socrates, how could those who say that he's not a god at all agree that he's a great god? Who says that, I asked. You for one, and I for another. How can you say this, I exclaimed. That's easy, said she. Tell me, wouldn't you say that all gods are beautiful and happy? Surely you'd never say a god is not beautiful or happy. Zeus, not I, I said. Well, by calling anyone happy, don't you mean they possess good and beautiful things? Certainly. What about love? You agreed he needs good and beautiful things, and that's why he desires them, because he needs them. I certainly did. Then how could he be a god if he has no share in good and beautiful things? There's no way he could, apparently. Now do you see? You don't believe love is a god either. Then what could love be, I asked, a mortal? Certainly not. And what is he? He's like we mentioned before, she said. He is in between mortal and immortal. What do you mean, Diotima? He's a great spirit, Socrates. Everything spiritual, you see, is in between God and mortal. What is their function, I asked. They are messengers who shuttle back and forth between the two, conveying prayer and sacrifice from men to gods, while to men they bring commands from the gods and gifts in return for sacrifices. Being in the middle of the two, they round out the whole and bind fast the all to all. Through them all divination passes, through them the art of priests in sacrifice and ritual, in enchantment, prophecy, and sorcery. Gods do not mix with men, they mingle and converse with us through spirits instead, whether we are awake or asleep. He who is wise in any of these ways is a man of the spirit, but he who is wise in any other way, in a profession or any manual work, is merely a mechanic. These spirits are many and various then, and one of them is love. So I thought I would present those two things together because Diana placed love in the middle and she said that love has desire, love has need. So Agathon said love has need of nothing, love is perfect. But I think that uh, this, this presentation of love is this needy thing and as a spirit, not not a God. But the, the interesting thing here is this presentation of spirit as between God and man, between the immortal and the mortal. And love is a spirit. And I put a footnote to the extent that that may tie to the Republic and what is said in the Republic about the divided soul, one part being spirit, the opposite being appetites, and both being moderated by reason, because she talks about reason and spirit in here. And there was one line in particular to, yeah, I think it's, it's this part in, in here, 
when she says it's judging things correctly without being able to give a reason, surely you see that this is not the same as knowing for how could knowledge be unreasoning? And again, I think that's kind of recalling this, the, the idea of the divided line of knowledge from the Republic. So there's a few references like that, I think, through this dialogue. And you know, what do we make of the contrast here of Diotima and what Agathon says? And is there grains of truth in what Agathon says? His rather categorical presentation of love as being perfect. Is, is Agathon mixing cause and effect there, perhaps? Is love perfection in itself, or is love a cause of perfection? I don't know if, if anybody has any thoughts on that. And this position of love as in between understanding and ignorance, it, it's kind of, I think, the way she's presenting it as maybe some sort of pathway, some sort of route to the good, the true, and the beautiful. Well, we'll start first with Alexander, as you haven't spoken, and then we'll go to Darren. Alexander. Uh, great to see you again, James. It's been a, been a good while. To see you. Indeed, yes. Good to see you. Um, super, super happy to be here. I do find, I, I read this thing a long time ago, and the theory was that all the people speaking about love are saying truths about it. Kind of what you said, I think, little grains of truth and stuff like that. I think specifically what you're referring to right now, that it is some idea between two opposites is, is really fascinating. Uh, in the Timaeus, he's going through um, all of these opposites that create the sphere, you know, like the divided line and the divided line, each division is some sort of inner set sphere. And uh, he, uh, he's talking about how you can use this generative framework of same, other, and essence, right? And uh, how he gets to the other is he has, you know, the initial sphere and he puts a diameter across it and then he divides that into a few places. And then the means between the divisions, so, you know, the four thirds, the two thirds, the eight twenty sevens, things like that, that is then how you start to access the others. Um, and it, so it seems like uh, whenever, you know, with the original divided line, one side you have pure abstract rational nature and the other you have sensation. You have two means in between. And it seems like it's the same thing where what he's saying is the gods and the physical are the two ends. And so, so whenever you're talking about love, you're talking about to correlate between the physicals and the pure abstract formations of means to elicit specific types of love that correspond between gods and physical things. Um, so, yeah, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and thank you for bringing the Timaeus into that because it makes me recall what's said in the Timaeus about uh, roundness and, you know, the, the circle, everything is composed of circles, uh, circle being that which is without beginning or end. And certainly the, the, presentation of Aristophanes as humans having started as spheres, I think could relate actually to that. And I'd like to do the the Timaeus next again. It was our first discussion when we launched this podcast. And uh, I think we'd like to to get back to it and maybe tie some of these things, not just from the symposium, but other things that we've learned since then uh, back to the Timaeus. I like the way that you kind of said, you know, the, the idea of the means to the end and, you know, the divided line of knowledge, uh, the mean and the extreme are actually concepts that are present in that uh, from the Republic. And so I think maybe there's some theme about mean and extreme coming both out of the Timaeus and out of the divided line of knowledge that may be applicable to love and that kind of path that finds its way in between all of this confusion and chaos, maybe this this kind of uh, resistance-free path in the middle of it all uh, that follows some sort of mean to get to that extreme of immortality. It will, it will never reach the immortality, but that's the means to the extreme. So thank you for bringing that into uh, into this, and we'll see uh, what Excellent. we can make of it. Yeah, uh, Darren, your thoughts? So I really like this idea of the in-between and the focus on that. Uh, uh, it's there's some similarities with well there's many similarities with what Plato says elsewhere about the in between how um like people skip over that even though there's like a lot of content and interesting stuff going on there like in the philippus which we read earlier this season talks about how people like like to think like 
everything is one or everything is change or flux or whatever. And they like bounce between these two and, but they forget, like, there's a lot of important knowledge in between. <laughs> so he was like, when people focus on those meta- metaphysical issues, they were just, he says there that, uh, or Socrates says there that people are just keeping themselves safe and sound. And like, they're just contented with themselves. They think they know everything. If they just say everything is one or everything is like flux, whereas actually there's a lot of knowledge you need in between. So it's not to deny that, you know, those categories, those ultimate pure categories are unimportant. It's not to deny that or not, not to deny that they're important, but but there's a lot of other stuff going on. And here, love is said, is said as something in between. So a part of that I like is when they say, I think this is related, that I really like this line. So he says of Socrates, you thought love was being loved rather than being a lover. I like the idea that you know love becomes a verb here and how like all the qualities that, for instance, Agathon <laughs> attributed to love are just sort of, you know, they're just sort of like superficial things that we see lovers wanting, but it's the activity that's um, important. That is the essence of love. And so actually this reminds me of, um, I just I just thought of this connection. There's a book by um, Eric Fromm, who it's called The Art of Loving. It's kind of, it's sort of a famous book. So it's interesting that the title is The Art of Loving, just what, like, what Socrates says he knows and he does in this dialogue, but also... Um, <laughs> The, if you just read the first few pages of that book, it's actually all about this theme. It's about how people mix up love as something they need to like become in order to be loved. Like all the he describes all the superficial qualities that people in like a consumer society think they need to like <laughs> they need to live up to all the standards people feel like they need to live up to in order to be loved, and they think that's the most important thing about love. People forget what actually is the most important about love, which is like love is an activity and what it consists in. And so yeah, that's just sort of interesting it's probably it's almost definitely influence it must be (laughs) so but yeah Mm -hmm. this idea of love being a lover rather than you know all the stuff about related to being loved is i think it's pretty interesting and provocative Mm -hmm. and i really like the way that you made that distinction near near the beginning of what you were saying that love is a verb maybe not a noun and that's that's an important distinction to make i think that uh, it's is as you said an activity and maybe what I was trying to say in the introduction is, is love the object of uh, knowledge? If it was, if it were the object of knowledge, then it would be teachable, but is love actually teachable uh, or how does it come about? I think it's, it seems to be from what Diotima is saying is it comes to about, about from a need. It's kind of in this neutral, uh, maybe androgynous type of position uh, which is uh, neither one or the other, but it, it's trying to find something. It's trying to find the immortality, which is the the path from our time bound state of becoming, uh, where each of us, each of our bodies, has a beginning and an end. That we can't do anything that, about that, uh, but what we can do is find, use reason to find that path of immortality, or that path to immortality, which we can strive for, and and that's love. I think is what she's saying. So that, that's great. Thank you. Love love as a verb. I, I like that. Uh, we'll go to Ernest and then Alexander. Yes, it's a very important point uh, about in between uh, because people get to extremes and it's even nowadays in, the, in every science, in every uh, analysis, psychology, people divide it uh, to the extremes. Even but there is always in between, and that, that's very important. Even when we have arguments with Darren and uh, argue on each uh, side, when we were watching a movie, a Black Girl, we, we had a disagreement, but then after our disagreement, I realized maybe answer is in between, uh, that both of us are right. Same goes with our former US uh, President Donald Trump. People are divided on in between, but it's not everything black and white. There are some good and some bad in what he was doing. So it's not like black and white. And it goes in any uh, relationship between uh, couples. They argue their point, but the solution should be in in negotiation and compromise. And it's uh, you have to take uh, each other point of view and do something in between. And same goes even precise sciences 
like mathematics and uh, physics, which we know sure that two plus two is five. Yeah. But at the same time, there is no maximum number or minimum number. Mm -hmm. uh, at two plus one multiplied even by two. So there is no extremes in it. It's precise. We know that it's full. So it's not even in uh, situations like, like we know for sure. That's great. And, and, and unfortunately, the sound was cutting out. I think my internet connection is not too great today. But uh, I know what you were saying about the mathematics. And I just actually put this quote from the Fido 96E to 97 on the cover page uh, where Socrates is saying uh, he doesn't know the cause of these things. How does one become two? And so interesting connection there that you made with, with that particular piece of logic. So thanks. And yeah, certainly there is always an in-between and maybe technology now is used sometimes to make us think that we have to be at one extreme or the other, but maybe it's finding the in-between part is the important part. And Maybe that's part of dialectic is that the the exercise of dialectic, nobody possesses the truth, which I think is what each of the speakers is demonstrating in their speeches. And Agathon even admits that he doesn't know anything. So maybe it's that not each of these speakers possesses the truth, but the truth comes out in between. And I think, you know, the, the way I read it after multiple reads of this dialogue, that's kind of what I see Di Diorama's role is here to bring out that dialectic to tie these ideas together, uh, have seeking a whole, well, what do you have in the middle of a whole of two halves? You have the middle and you have that kind of you know, path to, to no resistance, uh, the path to something greater, the path to immortal immortality. So, so thanks a lot for that. I think that was very, very helpful way of putting it. So uh, we'll go to Alexander. Man, this is such a good conversation. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> glad you were here. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember these, these talking with you. Somebody earlier, I think it was whoever spoke before, after I did last, I, I didn't catch the name, but he brought up the syllabus and uh, that put me on to uh, a very clear memory of like when you and I talked a long time ago, uh, and then a ton of work that I've done since then is the idea of the syllabus. One of the really cool things of the syllabus is that Promethean fire, and it's supposed to be the key that unlocks Plato. Uh, and so, you know, the, the Promethean fire is breaking everything down to a one, a mini, an indefinite, an indefinite. And then that creates a fractal or a scaling framework and that you then can connect those parts and pieces. And they use that same outline to create four categories, the definite, indefinites, essences, and causes. Uh, and then on top of that, he goes one step further and he basically creates four types of realities, if I can say that, you know, and one type of reality is all of the ideas. Another type of reality is all the physical things. And there's a third type, which is kind of the relationships between those two. And then a fourth type, which is a quantitative, you know, thing that tracks all four of those. And those four realities line up with the four parts of the divided line. All this to, to say, um, I wonder how we would actually go about using that Promethean fire to find or isolate the idea of love for that, that reality of the forms, you know, um, just one more memory to bring up is when we talked about music, he says music, you can identify the idea from, you know, the two opposites, the higher, lower, faster, slower. So higher, lower is the musical notes and you apply the definite. That's how you get specific, you know, the octave, the original two thirds and then faster, slower. And that's where you get rhythms, you know, the quarter note, whole note, half note, stuff like that. And then you combine those, right? And you can start getting all sorts of like quarter note out of C and stuff like that. Um, and then, so those are all the forms. And then you have the actual, let's say some guys playing the guitar down the street. That would be in the reality of physical things. And then you have something that's between those two that you can kind of combine of like all these things you're seeing and experiencing of people playing different songs and music and this pure you know, abstracted concept where you're isolating all the notes, then you have this, this kind of third world between, which is the world of relationships. And supposedly you can find these, these forms or essences in all three of those. All this to say, I wonder how we would use that Promethean fire to identify the sets of opposites and the definite divisions that would allow us to isolate a specific idea of love. 
and then go through a few examples of putting that that idea of love into motion or into relationships. Hmm. Interesting. And yeah, definitely bringing the philobus back into it. There was a lot of kind of mathematical and geometric references in the philobus. And as I said earlier, I see a lot of those in here as well, but they're, they're put in a way that are not meant to be obvious, but I think they are clearly there. And interesting that you mentioned forms, because I don't think we have talked about the forms yet in the context of the uh, symposium. And it just makes me think, you know, is love, love wouldn't be a form then if, if it wasn't, uh, it's more an activity, I guess, to find a path through the forms, maybe something like that. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing what others think about love and its relationship to the forms. When you talked about division, it made me think of the sophist and the theme of continuous division in the sophist. You keep dividing things until you find the first principle, but there's always an underlying first principle, and that's kind of the role of dialectic. So in the sophist, that was that was the way to find out the truth of the knowledge was to continuously divide. And yeah, there's there's connections here, certainly in terms of division. You know, the the sphere being divided into two, for example, the references to circles. You know, there's a lot of connections, I think, between all of these. And and the question actually of love and its connection to the forms. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, and I think we can explore that. So thanks, and Darren. Um, so uh, one more connection to this uh, theme of in between that I like. Hang on, I lost the page. <laughs> Well, I copied the quote. Sorry, it's in it's in the text. I swear. Uh, so, <laughs> um, anyway, so Diotima says that love is in between wisdom and ignorance as well. So, in fact, you see, none of the gods loves wisdom or wants to become wise, for they are wise, and no one else who is wise already loves wisdom. On the other hand, no one who is ignorance will love wisdom either. Or want to become wise for what's especially difficult about being ignorant is that you are content with yourself even though you're neither beautiful and good nor intelligent if you don't think you need anything of course you don't want what you don't think you need yeah so i, I just like this idea that i love being like again in between knowledge and ignorance but also like this description of the ignorance as people who are content with themselves <laughs> um yeah. i mean it's it's connected to a lot of um well a lot of what's said in other dialogues right like mm -hmm. The thing I mentioned before about people thinking they know everything if they, you know, say everything is one or whatever, like that, those ideas are like key people. He says there uh, in the philobus that it keeps people safe and sound. Also, it like stops them from thinking. Like they think they just, they're just satisfied. They think they know everything. And I think it happens in other dialects, like the Mino too, like that paradox of the Mino begins about learning. How is it possible to learn anything? And how, like, one, I think, I think one criticism of that is that, like, for, for whatever reason, people like, they take these paradoxes and like seems to seems to think it gives them license to like stop thinking like oh there's this interesting paradox isn't it curious and then there's like okay moving on but it's like no you're supposed to work through it so that we we can figure out how it is actually possible for us to learn um and of course all the plato's dialogues like the end in aporia so that's like not keeping the reader safe and sound it's like you gotta it's like you have to be at the edge of like knowledge like knowledge is some of like uncertain and dangerous or something you have to be at the edge of something in order to uh that's like where as a, at least for a human being that's where we should be in regards to uh, knowledge you know we shouldn't be safe and we shouldn't be so content with ourselves as he says here and if i may i just want to say one more thing about this comparison just coming back to this comparison between agathon and um uh, diotima I, I just really like this so i just want to put it out there i really love diotima's description of what love is like if we have to generate metaphors for love so that team uh, describes um hang on let me find a page number uh oh, okay so it's at 203d there we go that team uh, she says this here about love uh love is always poor and he's far from being delicate and beautiful as ordinary people think he is so i guess that would be <laughs> agathon <laughs> um instead uh love is tough and shriveled and shoeless and homeless always lying on the dirt without a bed sleeping at people's doorsteps and in roadsides under the sky i just love this very surprising description of love as you know as being dirty <laughs> and like kind of being like creepy like sleeping at people's <laughs> doorsteps <laughs> and like pouncing on people like a later on okay. if you keep reading 
he, he describes love as being like a hunter and good at creating snares. Yeah. So it's almost like love is like this creepy little <laughs> creature who's just like uh, who shrivel and tough and you know just you know is sleeping outside your doorstep ready to pounce or something. Like it's a very surprising description, but it seems like there's truth to it. Like it's it's sort of lovely in how surprising it is. Um, but of course, this is contrasted with Agathon's previous description, which actually people might even prefer to <laughs> um, Diotima's. So uh, James uh, read, like, he's described as being, like, delicate and beautiful and supple. But there, there's this other part that I love, too, about what Agathon says, just because I think it's kind of funny that, like, how love has beautiful skin, has, like, his coloring of the skin <laughs> is beautiful, and how he only seeks out to be with, like, young people or whatever like he only he doesn't want to be around old people so i guess that like maybe uh, leaves out socrates and others mm-hmm. agathon creates a maybe a kind of like stereotypical again maybe a kind of conventional view of love and you know we might buy into it just because it seem, seems to speak to so many conventions we've been i guess we've been fed <laughs> all the time um but ultimately like the love that agathon describes is it sounds kind of superficial right and kind of almost dainty <laughs> in a way because rather than like tough, as Diotima says, because um, Agathon says like, love even like has to sleep amongst flowers or consort with Mm -hmm. flowers. And he only rests where like, (laughs) it's flowery and fragrant. So I just found like descriptions like that to be like, almost like laughably, like exaggerated in a way that what, like what Agathon is, the the kinds of descriptions, descriptors that Agathon is reaching for. Like love, you know, only sleeps among flowers (laughs) and whatever. Whereas for Diotima, love like sleeps on the dirt outside your door <laughs> on yeah, the that, ground it, so, that, that's why i thought the contrast was really good and, and uh, thank yeah. you for reading that line about love being dirty and needy and <laughs> grubby yeah. it, it actually kind of makes me think of i wonder if it's a veiled reference to socrates oh yeah, yeah socrates yeah. is kind of dirty and sleeping on people's doorsteps and scheming to find knowledge or to to trip them up in their in in their thinking um yeah, it just occurred to me as you read that. It, it made me think maybe that was one of the aims of that. Yeah. For sure. And another connection might be that Agathon's description sort of seems to really emphasize like the superficial aspects of love, like having like beautiful skin and radiant skin. <laughs> but um, of course, Socrates is not known for that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that would sort of maybe exclude someone like him. Yeah. So and of course, Ag- you know, the description and in fact, the description of, as you, as you just said, the description that Tima provides might actually be more similar to Socrates, although it's it's it might be even more extreme than that. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it certainly it takes it to an extreme, I think. But it, it's interesting because at the beginning of the dialogue, they did mention that Socrates actually put on a new pair of sandals and washed for the event. So there's there's a connection here. I, I think there's a connection here to to this condition of love as being incredibly needy. And so maybe Socrates is this incredibly needy person looking for truth, beauty, and goodness and trying to find it in this group of hungover Athenians and and finding grains of truth in the process. So, so that that's great. And I, I really like the way too, you um, highlighted the difference between ignorance and knowledge and love is in between. Maybe love's role is in navigating that uncertainty that exists between ignorance and knowledge. And to that extent, to the extent that Diotima acknowledges ignorance and its shortcomings and the, the fact that the ignorant don't know what they don't know makes me think that she is, if she's a sophist, you know, as I said, she's a different type of sophist. She's not the sophist that thinks that she knows everything, like uh, Hippias or Protagoras. So uh, this is a very different type of sophistry going on here, I think. It's love of love, I think. Um, so so thanks for highlighting that uh, that difference. Well, we'll go to Alexander, and then I have a reading to kind of end up the session today because we have about 15 minutes left. So um, I thought I would read at the end this this part that Socrates says. So, uh, Alexander, your thoughts? I'll be really quick. There's a couple of things that were said that, first, it was really fun to listen to. You were you're laughing the whole time. There's a lot of <laughs> joviality to it. Um, what you just said, uh, James, I find really interesting because in the sophist, I believe whenever they're making a distinction between the philosopher, which they say is like a dog and they, they give like uh, a really quick, well, in the Republic, they say it's like a dog, but in the sophist, they give a quick categorization where you find the philosopher. And then obviously the sophist, they take seven categorizations to catch him. Uh, they basically say like, as the philosopher is a dog, the sophist is like a wolf. 
you know, it's like a fully armed sort of creature because it has the mastery of money and persuasion, right? It's like a very dangerous, powerful creature. So it does seem like it, it, it can hold a lot of different types of forms. Next thing that I found really interesting uh, that I think I just got a picture a glimpse of that I love about what Diatoma does is it makes me for the first time kind of realize what that noble lie is that he talks about in the Republic when he says, we basically got to tell kids noble lies, which is like, we got to give them myths, right? And that's what he's saying. I finally understood, I think, of like where a lot of the, you know, myths of the gods originate. Because what I understand from the Timaeus and the nature of the gods is that like you have all of these ideas and they're all mathematically placed out. And then you bring these ideas into the world. So you give them souls, right? And then like you have a god of fire, of earth, or yada, yada. And you have an ideological abstraction. But then whenever you would look at all the different types of fire in the world, that is like a physical manifestation of the god, right? But when we're talking about the mythology behind it, really what you're saying is like, okay, we created an abstract essence and then we created, you know, all the correlations or causalities between different essences. And then what we're, we're doing is we're just storifying, you know, we're creating stories around the interactions and causalities between all of these different essences, which is such a strange and cool way to tell your kids, okay, yeah, if you mix water and dirt, you're going to get mud. But really what we're saying is like this God made it with this God and produced this God. Right. And all of a sudden now we have a new concoction and you can do that all the way down. So you get justice in time. So I found that really interesting. And then one more thing that I found really cool about what Darren was saying. Uh, it sounds like what Diotoma is saying about love is actually what love is. You know, that's why Socrates rebukes him. And he says like, uh, he's like, if you guys want me to tell you what the truth is of love and not just you know, like praise love, then I'll do that. Whereas everybody else, it seems like they're telling these stories or the different muses, they're, they're animating the things that they love, qualities that they find in the loved. Whereas she isn't talking about the object that is loved. She is talking about the love itself, which I find like a really cool distinction. That's great, actually. And that pointing out the that the speakers are animating the things that they love is interesting because we tend to do that. And maybe I, I like the way that you drew that connection to the myths. And, you know, Eric has reminded us of, of several times about these myths and how the stories go. And maybe it just made me think that maybe the myths are some form of analogy by which things were understood and then they get passed down over time. And the analogies sometimes mistaken as the truth uh, but they do maybe illustrate some grains of truth and maybe that's this whole issue in this dialogue of finding those grains of truth and tying them together and using love to tie them together and love has an object love is needy and, and what it needs is the object and i think that's maybe what comes through in what diorama says in terms of love being needy and always wanting always desiring Love isn't an object that we pursue as the end. Love is the means to an end, I think, is maybe maybe the way of seeing it. Um, so so thank you for that. that. That was really good context, I think. Um, so I wanted to read this last bit. So there, there's kind of three speeches that we were hearing today. And Socrates speaks mostly through the voice of Diotima, but this is actually Socrates' voice here at 198b to 199b. And he's kind of talking here, I think, about cause and effect. And maybe this this question then of love being either subject or object, uh, you know, what is actually the cause and what is actually the effect? So anyway, the 198B, Eryximachus starts. You were being prophetic about one thing, I think, said Eryximachus, that Agathon would speak so well. But you, tongue-tied? No, I don't believe that. Plus you, said Socrates, how am I not going to be tongue-tied, I or anyone else, after a speech delivered with such beauty and variety? The other parts may not have been so wonderful, but that at the end. Who would not be struck dumb on hearing the beauty of those of the words and phrases? Anyway, I was worried that I'd not be able to say anything that came close to them in beauty, and so I would almost have run away and escaped if there had been a place to go. And, you see, the speech reminded me of Gorgias so that I actually experienced what Homer describes. I was afraid that Agathon would end by sending the Gorgian head, awesome at speaking in a speech, against my speech, and this would turn me into stone by striking me dumb. Then I realized how ridiculous I'd been to agree to join with you in praising love, and to say that I was a master of the art of love, when I knew nothing whatever of this business, of how anything whatever ought to be praised. 
In my foolishness, I thought you should tell the truth about whatever you praise, that this should be your basis, and that from this a speaker should select the most beautiful things and arrange them most suitably. I was quite vain, thinking that I would talk well and that I knew the truth about praising anything whatever. But now it appears that this is not what it is to praise anything whatever. Rather, it is to apply to the object the grandest and the most beautiful of qualities, whether he actually has them or not. And if they are false, that is no objection, for the proposal, apparently, was that everyone here make the rest of us think that he is praising love, and not that he actually praise him. I think that is why you stir up every word and apply it to love. Your description of him and his gifts is designed to make him look better and more beautiful than anything else, to ignorant listeners, plainly, for of course he wouldn't look that way to those who knew. And your praise did seem beautiful and respectful, but I didn't even know the method for giving praise, and it was in ignorance that I agreed to take part in this. So the tongue promised and the mind did not. Goodbye to that. I'm not giving another eulogy using that method. Not at all. I wouldn't be able to do it. But if you wish, I'd like to tell the truth my way. So I want to avoid any comparison with your speeches so as not to give you a reason to laugh at me. So look, Phaedrus, would a speech like this satisfy your requirement? You will hear the truth about love and the words and phrasing will take care of themselves. So this is Socrates speaking just after Agathon's beautifully poetic speech about superlatives about love. And this is where Socrates then goes on to introduce Diotima's discussion with him. And there was a couple of interesting things I thought in this part where Socrates is talking about primarily the truth, I think, was, which is his goal. Uh, he says, you will hear the truth about love and the words and phrasing will take care of themselves. So to me, that was maybe a way of saying that there are grains of truth in the words, but the words get mixed up sometimes and the, the words have different meanings to different people. And maybe it's this truth that is out there somewhere that, again, through this dialectic process, they find the path to the truth. And, you know, if, of course, there's the other parts of this where he's kind of poking fun at the other speakers and Agathon in particular for all of those poetic flourishes. Uh, so poetry is one thing, he says, but the truth is quite another here we've heard Aristophanes, Agathon, and now Socrates, and then the voice of Diotima through Socrates. So what do you make of this? And the question, which I thought I would start with maybe in our last session in two weeks on the symposium, which is what the art of love is. And maybe that goes a little bit to what Darren was saying earlier about love as a verb. And maybe thinking about that, because uh, Socrates does refer to the art of love in this, and he proclaimed at the beginning that he knew the art of love, which is an interesting thing for Socrates to say, because normally he goes about saying that he knows nothing. So it's an art that he knows. It's not knowledge that he knows. It's an art that he knows. Let's maybe see what we can make of that. So we'll go with Darren and then Alexander. I really like this passage, so I'm glad you read it. Um, it's so well written and there's a lot of meaning in it. I especially love the line here that it just, it's so pointed. So he says that the proposal apparently was that everyone here make the rest of us think he is praising love and not, he, not that he actually praises him. So I mean, that's just so great. This is a great line. And I think it really brings out, again, this theme you were just discussing about uh, truth and how it's not the same as beauty. Maybe that's obvious, but like sometimes it can be mixed up. Because Plato does want to, I think, draw close connections between like these concepts like beauty, truth, and goodness, um, but they're not exactly related. So it's important to keep them separated, right? So I think at the start of this, he says, who would not be struck dumb on hearing the beauty of the words and phrases, you know, referring to um, the speech and how at the end here, uh, he says, it was a beautiful speech anyway, Agathon, <laughs> yeah. as if, you know, to provide at least a bit of comfort for Agathon. Yeah. At least it was a beautiful speech. Um, so... Yeah, so I mean, it, it doesn't make it explicit, but what it's doing, right, is like making a distinction between beauty and truth and how, although they can be closely related, they're also not exactly the same thing. So that's important to keep in mind. And I think it's important, maybe important to keep in mind later on too, right? Because there's so much discussion of beauty later on. We, we'll probably have to discuss this next week, but um, maybe that's something to keep in mind about beauty per se. Mm -hmm. um, it also touches a theme of, um, this is another theme it touches on that I kind of like in Plato, you know, the appearance versus reality. I think this section also touches on that. Um, uh, later on at the end of the reading today, Plato talks about, or Plato, Stiatima talks about wanting to 
give birth to uh, virtue itself rather than just images of virtue. So the idea of like the contrast between images of virtue and and true virtue, I think he says there, she says there is interesting because I think a lot of these dialogues are talking about this contrast between what just appears to be virtue and what is actually virtue. And just, okay, last really quick point is that, um, so it's interesting that there's another thing that I like about this is, um, well, I don't know if I like about like like it, but it's, um, I think an interesting part of it is that, um, Socrates says Agathon sounds like um, uh, Gorgias, the sophist, and in the footnote, which was helpful. So apparently Gorgias had a style that was apparently considered to be the most like persuasive or whatever. <laughs> it's in the footnote of the uh, text. And he was sort of speaking in that style. So I guess that's why everyone was like erupting in applause um, afterwards <laughs> after he finished. Even Socrates was actually. So that's an interesting note. So even Socrates was sort of like caught up in it. And later on, uh, Socrates will say Diotima also sounded like a sophist. So I just want to point out that I don't think Socrates is saying that either of these Agathon or Diotima is a sophist. I think he's just saying that a certain points for maybe Diotima, but for Agathon generally, that they sound like sophists. I don't think he's saying that they're getting money or whatever. So, and for Diotima, I think it's only in reference. Like I this, again, this is my interpretation. Like I, I feel like it's. There, there is a reference to Diotima sounding like a sophist, but it, I think it only applies to a specific section because in other sections where Diotima speaks, Socrates sort of very like happily goes along, you know, as if maybe being carried along by <laughs> love itself, maybe. I don't know. Like he assents to what Diotima is saying, but at, at various points, Socrates is like, maybe, and, you know, she's sounding like a sophist here. So it's like, maybe we're, we're supposed to at least like, you know, think about it a bit. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's good. And I like the attention you drew to the idea of appearances and the connection you made to the the striking dumb comment, which I guess would be if the listener to the of the speech were simply to accept all of the superlatives about love that had been spoken, then the listener would have nothing further to say and would be stricken dumb. And I think maybe that's what he's trying to say is that we don't just deal with the appearances of love, but we need to find out what love itself actually is. So not what lovely things are, but what love itself is. And that's maybe this this line here, you know, everyone here make the rest of us think he is praising love and that not that he actually praise him. That was a good line. And uh, yeah, so thanks for that. And definitely we'll look, I think, for what the true, the good and the beautiful are uh, in our last session as well. So uh, let's see if we can tie those concepts up because they keep getting mentioned throughout the first two sessions that we've uh, had now in the symposium. So we'll go to Alexander and Ernest, and then I think we will uh, end today's session. So Alexander. Man, you guys are some scholars. <laughs> this is some good stuff. Um, so there's three points. Um, couple that Darren said and the one that James said uh first one is love is an action so I guess to expand on that thing I was saying earlier about the uh, Philebus and it, this corresponds with the divided line in the cave is that the uh, Philebus with the category so I kind of texted this but just to, to clarify you have four categories right the definites the indefinites and the indefinites are more and less definites are the same thing quantitative and sameness and then you have the essences which is the creation of a combination of definites and definites and then you have the causals which is just a relationship between the different essences um but then you can actually see these four uh as actually and this to me is the greatest thing of the key as uh, actually corresponding to the categories of Archytas and the categories in the Organon of Aristotle. I believe it, it's the mathematical key to unlock all of Aristotle and all the correspondence between Aristotle and Plato. So you can think of the definites as quantities, the indefinites as relationships, the essences as substances, and then the causes as qualities. And so if that's the case, then you could categorize love as a quality and specifically it's a quality at which is an affection you get somebody gets love and then they get the affection of love and obviously if you get an affection enough times or for long enough yeah uh, they explain both the organon and architis that it then becomes a habit which is another one of the subcategories if that's the case then it would say that love is actually again of the causal framework um and then one more point on that whole thing is that some po at some point in plato he says that even if you unlock all the mathematical secrets that basically he's hiding in the works, but you don't unlock the nature of the words, 
then you you end up with nothing, which I find so fascinating, right? Yeah, so this whole thing is like you have to unlock this whole crazy harmonious soul mathematical substructure, like this wild OS, but just as important, you have to unlock the nature of words and how they correspond from you know the Promethean fire or whatever to all the basic ideas. And only when you have those two halves do you have the full thing. Um, okay, so the next thing that I found really interesting was poetry versus truth. And this goes back to the Republic. You know, constantly he's rebuking the nature of poetry. And until the very end, he's like, maybe we can say poetry, yada, yada, yada. And his whole thing in the Timaeus and the Republic is basically you have these two entities of your soul, right? So your soul has a tripartite. You have reasoning, you have something in between, which is courage, which is partly rational and partly appetitive. That's what the Philippus talks about, the Philebus. And then you have just the appetitive nature, right? And then so you have kind of your heart, which is in the center between those two things. And so often poets, and this is what, you know, one of Socrates' biggest rebukes, you can see this in the Apology, is that he's constantly trying to attack poets who only try to persuade, you know, one side of your soul, which is this like, uh, well, technically it's the middle part of your soul, but just they're trying to use these words and these sweet notions and all this that compels you to emotionally believe something without the knowledge behind it. Whereas like you can never persuade somebody like a doctor. He says, this is one of the examples. You could never persuade a doctor who had knowledge. He says in the Gorgias, who had knowledge of medicine without you providing knowledge of medicine, you know? Um, so then his whole rectification of poetry in the Republic is basically, well, let's keep the sweets. Like he says in the Philippus, let's keep a little bit of pleasure with knowledge because that's the only place you find a good life, but you have to have first and foremost, the intellectual side. And then the last thing, kind of appearance of virtue versus actual virtue is like the divided line, actual virtue. You have to find on the quantified, you know, part and then abstract it and then, you know, rectify your soul and your body to follow it in society. Whereas the appearance of virtue is like at the beginning of the Republic when they're debating about justice versus injustice. And is it better to look just and be hyper unjust and, and the opposite? And then he shows that actually the greatest torture of all is to become the tyrant who is bound in injustice and has endless amounts of resources because nothing can stop him from torturing himself. Whereas vice versa, if you're just and you have a just nation, it is the greatest blessing of all time. Those are so many great connections that you've made there, I think. And you know, you mentioned the word harmonious, which I think is something that is maybe trying to connect all of this and, and the mentioning of harmony by Diotima in connection with love is, I think, maybe something that relates to cause. And so the, the cause of good, true and beautiful maybe is love uh, or love is what harmonizes all of that. Um, so interesting, interesting connection there. And certainly thanks for calling into attention that word harmony. It also makes me think, as you spoke, about the five key forms in the sophist, that which is change, rest, the same and the different. And if in the philobus, wisdom is knowledge of motion, then those five key forms are what motion forms around, or motion centers around those five key forms. Motion being both change in spatial position and change in physical state. And so, you know, maybe again, love is this kind of path that has no resistance that's in the middle of all of that and maybe allows us to have that knowledge uh, of motion or wisdom uh, knowledge of motion uh, in a way that does not lead to confusion and does not lead us to one extreme or the other but keeps us centered and focused in the middle and harmonious i think with all of the motion going around maybe so i, I thought uh, about those five key forms came to mind as you were speaking so thanks for that and Ernest. What are your thoughts? Well, it's unfortunate uh, that it's, uh, we cannot discuss more deeply uh, other topics, uh, especially if uh, Diotima was a fictional character or a real person. But uh, I want to quickly talk about uh, Sophist and uh, Gorgias' uh, point of view of the world that mentioned uh, here. Uh, we have extant work of Gorgias on Helen and what he's trying to say when we mention Gorgias, that we have a perception of uh, common perceptions in, in public, but uh, sophists can turn it around and make it totally different. In his work on Helen, people in Greece were convinced that cause of the Trojan War was Helen. But in his work, he was able to prove with uh, using arguments 
that Helen is innocent. It's not her fault. So you cannot use perception. You need to argue. And he was, uh, Daitimo, using arguments to prove that it's not what uh, we perceive, but realities might be totally different. So that's my point. Mm -hmm. And that's a great observation. And maybe that takes back to what Alexander was saying earlier about the Timaeus and that connection. And my favorite part in Timaeus 28a, where it talks about the distinction between the realm of becoming, which we inhabit in our time-bound existence and the eternal realm of being, and perception doesn't apply to the eternal realm of being. We have to turn perception off and use reason, uh, tie together all of the perspective, all of the perceptions, and use reason there, and not get confused about the cause, um, as you highlighted. I think that was a very good connection that you made with Gorgias. So, so thank you for that. And you know, certainly in our next session, it's a shorter. So we'll finish off reading of the symposium in our next session, but it's a shorter section. So I think we can come back to. Diodema, we can come back to any of the things that we've spoken about here and just, you know, expand on them, but also tie them together and and see if we can divine, to use a uh, a word that keeps coming up in the dialogue, to to divine or use some divination to find what really the key message about love is in this dialogue. Is it what it seems to be, or is it are there many layers? Can we maybe uncover a few layers? of what uh, is really being said about love here in this dialogue and and the relationship of people uh, to love when they're speaking about it or when they're thinking about it. So uh, interesting idea. So let's let's hold these thoughts and, and come back to revisit some of what we've discussed, maybe cover some of the parts we didn't get to today because there was a, there was a lot of material in today's section. And um, we'll uh, look forward to reconvening in two weeks and reaching some of our own conclusions maybe about the the symposium. So I wanted to thank everybody today for, for being here and for a, a wonderful discussion. It's uh, As always, we've found new connections, which I think is the, the key about dialectic is we may come in with certain ideas, but I think we leave with new and expanded ideas. And I think that's always a great thing from this and, and why I enjoy doing this uh, podcast so much. And so I hope everybody can attend our final session on the symposium in two weeks. And uh, so I'll end the recording uh, now, but I will uh, invite anybody who wants to stay online for a half hour unrecorded casual discussion on philosophy in general or in Plato or in what we've just discussed to stay online for Plato's Cafe. And otherwise, uh, those who have to go, we'll see you in two weeks, I hope. So thanks for being here. Thank you.